Aloha. For those of you who don't know me or are watching us online for the first time, my name is Pastor Chris. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, I want to welcome you to First United Protestant Church of Hilo. I'm so grateful you have decided to join us for worship today. In today's worship service, we welcome Cassie Chi, who has her Master's in Divinity and who will be our guest preacher. Cassie is a member in discernment of the Hawaii Conference's Oahu Association and is a community organizer for Faith Action for Community Equity. Before we begin our worship service, we will honor the victims that were killed this week in Uvalde, Texas, school shooting, with the responsive litany to end gun violence. There will be 22 candles, 21 for all the victims that were killed, and an additional candle for the husband that passed away a day later. Join us in our responsive litany. For those of you who just came, the litany is between the music and the announcements. I'll give you a moment here. We pray in remembrance of those impacted by gun violence, both those who have been injured and those who have been killed and cities and towns across our country, even those close to our home. We hold their memories dear. We treasure those lives permanently altered through injury or those taken in senseless acts of violence. And we pray that they might find rest and peace. May their lives continue to make a difference in our world. Together we pray. God of mercy, Heal our broken hearts. We raise our prayers in remembrance of the families and friends of the victims of gun violence in our nation this week. Comfort those who mourn. Dry the tears of those who weep. Sustain those who feel diminished. And impart courage to the hearts of those who feel helpless. Together we pray. God of peace, sustain our broken hearts. We pray in remembrance of all communities torn apart by gun violence. We are too familiar with places like Parkland, Columbine, Aurora, Orland, Orlando, Newtown, Roseburg, and Charleston, but there are countless others. Each incident of violence affects all of us in our daily lives. Renew our resolve to pursue peace in our cities and towns and to respect the dignity of all human life. Together we pray. God of comfort, encourage our broken hearts. We pray in remembrance of school teachers and administrators who put their students' needs ahead of their own safety. We pray for first responders who witness the horror of gun violence while in service to our communities. And we pray for all those with responsibility for law enforcement. We give thanks for their call to protect and serve and to seek justice, which is inspirational to others. And we pray that their emotional wounds will be healed. Together we pray. God of courage, inspire our broken hearts. We pray for those lives taken by gun violence through suicide and through accidental shootings, especially when those shootings involve children. We pray for those who are impacted by gun violence through domestic violence during this time of pandemic. Console and strengthen those whose despair are great. Together we pray. God of hope, 
comfort our broken hearts. We pray in remembrance of all people impacted by gun violence, as gun violence knows no boundaries but can affect all nationalities, races, cultures, faiths, genders, and socioeconomic classes. It can affect us where we live, where we worship, where we work, where we study, and where we play. Together we pray. God of love, transform our broken hearts. We pray for those who have committed acts of gun violence and for their families. We remember those suffering from mental illness who have gone untreated and those suffering from loneliness and isolation. We pray for those who use guns, power, and violence rather than respect and dignity to reconcile differences. Grant us the strength to pursue justice with a voice of love. Together we pray. God of forgiveness, enlighten our broken hearts. We pray for all community leaders and elected officials. Give them insight, wisdom, and courage to address the epidemic of gun violence. Pour forth your spirit on all our neighborhoods and break the chains of violence that bind your people. Together we pray. God of power, strengthen our broken hearts. Today, we pray for ourselves and for others in our lives who have been touched by gun violence. Pausing for a moment in silence. Together we pray. God of astonishing mercy, compassion, and immeasurable love, restore our broken hearts and enliven our confidence to find new ways to revive our world, to become one of peace. Amen. Join me for our call to worship. The voice of the Holy Spirit has spoken and guided us here this morning. Who do we follow? There are many voices in our world, some distracting and not always life-giving, which are calling out to us. Who do we follow? There is the story of the one who has shown people the way, the truth, and the life. But his way is not easy. It is quite difficult, in fact, and few choose to follow him. In this hour, tell us more. Tell us how we might live, breathe, and have life through him. As we worship together, tell us how we can do the work he did. Now is our time of daily affirmation. 
there are three separate affirmations. The first will be for us. The second will be for a neighbor or someone near us. And the third will be for our community and our world. The first affirmation. I am guided by God, and a way is being made before me right now. Now we will bravely turn to a neighbor or someone near us and bravely look them in the eyes and affirm for them, you are being guided by God, and a way is being made before you right now. Now for our community, and our world. We are being guided by God, and a way is being made before us right now. Join us for our opening hymn, number 146, Arise, Your Light Has Come. Our peace reading for today comes from the belated Eugene H. Peterson, who was a minister, theologian, author, and translator of the Message Bible. Among his writings, Eugene says, One way to define spiritual life is getting so tired and fed up with yourself, you go on to something better, which is following Jesus. Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 30, where Jesus announces the good news from the scroll of Isaiah that was for the poor and the oppressed. Then Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. And a report about him spread all throughout the surrounding region. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was the custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set those free who are oppressed, to proclaim the year the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. 
the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All who spoke well of him were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb. Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things you have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And there were also many with skin disease in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman in Syria. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were fixed with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off a cliff. But he passed through them, through the midst of them, and went on his way. May this word reveal your wisdom and your ways. Thanks be to God. Aloha, everyone. Good morning. Well, thank you for welcoming me uh, to worship with you today. Um, I actually came down to Hilo this weekend to do some organizing with some folks um, that have been incarcerated recently, so we had some good storytelling yesterday. But my name is Cassie. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Director of Community Organizing at Faith Action for Community Equity. And my dad is Okinawan in Chinese. He called Pearl City growing up, um, home growing up. And my mom is Korean, and she was an immigrant to Los Angeles. Um, and that's kind of where she considered home. So I myself was raised on Duwamish land, Kirkland, Washington, also the birthplace of Costco. Um, but Hawaii has always been a second home for me. Um, this is the place where I came to visit my family and where I first learned the importance of love and connection and community. So over the past couple of years, while I was finishing my uh, Masters of Divinity, um, I moved to Oahu to take an internship um, at Central Union Church um, and also to be closer with my grandma after my grandfather had passed here. And please keep her in your prayers. Um, she is entering hospice this week, so we're entering some transitions for our family. And I never imagined that I would move here to Hawaii, but um, it was really through my grandma's commitment to caring for home, for family, and for your people that inspired me to do the same here in faith. So as I mentioned, I work for an organization called Faith Action for Community Equity. And Faith Action is an interfaith, grassroots nonprofit that was find it, uh, founded excuse me, in the 90s by some different clergy members and community organizers. So right now we're made up of about 25 member units, mostly on Oahu, um, and most of them are churches. So our purpose is to put our faith into action by cultivating liberatory and life-affirming changes in our community. So over the past 26 years, some of the things we have fought for are affordable housing in Kalihi, more accessibility on buses for Kupuna, and accountability for our public officials to uphold their kuleana to our community. More recently, in the past couple years, we've been organizing around um, shutting down the fuel tanks at Red Hill, 
and advocating for just re justice reform in our state's prisons. So I would love to talk with any of you if you want to learn more about Faith Action or even this church being a part of it. Um, that's always a possibility. So please join me in a posture of prayer this morning and then we'll get into the sermon. Kinakula, I've done my study and I need your spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. The translation of the word faith in the ancient biblical Greek is piste, from the word pisteos. This means belief, firm persuasion, assurance, confidence. It is that belief and hope that is so intense that it informs the ways that people live their lives. Those in the scripture referred to as people of great faith were those that were willing to give everything or to completely transform their lives for the sake of what they believed in. So I think that the connection between faith and action is pretty simple. If you have faith, it'll move you to practice it, to act in your daily life. So for those of us that consider ourselves people of the Christian faith, I think the question that we need to ask ourselves then is, who is the God that we have faith in? What is God's character? Because we must know the character of God to know what wisdom there is in faith. So in the passage that was read from us this morning, the people heard Jesus state God's purpose for him on earth plainly and then decided that he should be thrown off of a cliff. So what was so agitating or radical about what Jesus said that the people decided that he should be killed for it? What would it have looked like for the people to react in faith instead? When we meet Jesus in this passage, he's already gained a lot of buzz throughout the land. Jesus was preaching as one who knew the ancient Hebrew scriptures well and who had authority through the Spirit. And in the Christian tradition, these people had been waiting for hundreds of years for their Messiah. They were tired of the Roman occupation and oppression and hungry for a Savior. They were ripe and ready for God to show up. Right? How does Luke begin? with Zechariah, one among many priests who were waiting faithfully at the temple to hear a word from God. In verse 14, we read that Jesus is preaching as one filled with the power of the Spirit, and while we don't know specifically what he is preaching, I imagine that what the people were hearing had some of the same joy and charisma as the gospel song by Ricky Dillard, More Abundantly. Does anybody know the song? Jesus would enter into various synagogues and proclaim, I've come that you might have life more abundantly. I've come that you might have life through eternity. I did not come to condemn the world or shame you of your wrongs. I have come to mend the broken heart and to give your heart a song. I've come to give you life. I've come to give you joy. more abundantly. When he comes to his hometown, Nazareth, Jesus unrolls the scroll of the Hebrew scriptures and reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Powerful. If we had to identify the thesis or the purpose of Jesus' ministry, I think that this might be it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The people listening likely Israelites, were besides themselves. Jesus was telling them that he was the one that they had been waiting for, the Messiah, 
the one that their grandma and their grandma's grandma and their grandma's grandma's grandma had been waiting on for generations. They expected that Jesus came to save them. But when Jesus really gets into what he means, it is a slightly different message than what the Israelites expect from him. The passage that Jesus quotes from is one that we find today in Isaiah 61. So when the people hear Jesus is coming to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, they already have their own ideas about what that means. It was also known as the year of Jubilee. And in the ancient laws, the year of Jubilee was a just act of God in which every 49th year, someone would come and blow a trumpet, a signal throughout the whole land that everything, land, property, and sovereignty of people would be returned to its original caretakers. This was to restore economic and social balance, balance of relationship between people and land, and to remind the people that they were mere stewards of what God had gifted to them. When they heard Jesus say that his coming was the fulfillment of scripture to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the Israelites thought that Jesus was coming to restore what was theirs. This was true. Jesus did come to let the oppressed, including the Israelites, go free. However, what they overlooked was that Jesus did not just come for them, but now was proclaiming freedom for all, Israelites and non-Israelites, also known as Gentiles. So what makes the people so upset is that the examples of acts of faith that Jesus gives to them are of prophets caring for and healing Gentiles, foreigners. In the first, Jesus reminds them that when the prophet Elijah had to run from the king of Israel, it was a Gentile widow who took him in and cared for him. In the second example, he reminds them that the only person with leprosy that the prophet Elisha was remembered for healing was also a Gentile, a Syrian. The people become angry with Jesus because this was not the savior they were looking for. This was not how Jesus was supposed to be. Jesus was supposed to bring good news for them, God's first chosen people, not for those foreigners that they looked down on or ignored. For this reason, the people were filled with rage and decided to throw Jesus off of the cliff. And I think it can sometimes feel easy for us today to look back and even look down on these people and say, wow, Jesus was proclaiming good news to them and they couldn't even hear it. The character of God that Jesus claimed is a God who came to proclaim social and economic justice and life for all people, not just the chosen few. However, when we really get down to what Jesus' words mean in practice, I find the reaction of those in Nazareth much more relatable. Uh, the story I'm about to share is not to shame a particular church, but just to call out a theme I often see in various churches that I've worshipped in and preached in. So I was once asked to write a devotional for a UCC church here in Hawaii, and I wrote something like, um, to some, the architecture of this church might be a reminder of the solidness of God's love and faithfulness, and to some, it might be a reminder of the church's participation in the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. The response I received in an edit was that the church was not ready to talk about that history again. When Jesus said, God has sent me to let the oppressed go free, God meant literally in the here and now. To be people that follow Jesus, is to be a people who are willing to face the ugliest parts of our history and to pray for transformation with mouths, hands, and feet. There is no separation between faith and action, no separation between social justice and the gospel when we really take a look at what it means to follow the Jesus we find in Luke. I'll read verse 18 just one more time because what Jesus requires of us, of those who follow him, 
is not a mystery. He really makes it quite plain. Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Our challenge is to know how the radical practices of Jesus' love still benefit us today. From this passage, we learn that we should not respond to Jesus as the people in Nazareth did, by trying to harm Jesus or to cancel the parts of Jesus that we may not like. Instead, perhaps we can take away two lessons. To listen to the ideas that may make us feel uncomfortable, and to listen, learn, and partner with those among us who are most vulnerable. This is faith. When we hear indigenous, native Hawaiian, and black people calling for reparations and the return of land, can we pause and check in with what we're feeling? Listen to what they are saying. And really ask ourselves what bringing good news to the oppressed might actually require of us today. When we hear people calling for the abolition of prisons, can we pause and ask, why is this necessary? What other ways of community safety and accountability are people imagining? What might proclaiming release of the captives actually mean of us today? When we hear about, I remember Sai Cap, a young Micronesian boy who was killed for running from the police last year. When we hear about our houseless neighbors being called and treated as less than human. When we hear about the irreparable desecration of water. Can we check ourselves and our communities to ask, who was Jesus and why was he crucified? Jesus did not just come to save the chosen few, the Israelites, the ones who at the time were the only people who could follow the religious rules. Jesus also came to proclaim good news of life and justice for those among us who are forced to live closest to sickness, violence, and death. Those that may be called less than and considered foreigners. We must expect then that perhaps where we find Jesus is not only here in our churches, but also in our world. Those whose deaths we feel are okay to excuse or justify because of ethnicity or class are maybe closer to the cross than some things that we may find in our church. Last year when I read articles about I Remember and read comments that this Micronesian boy deserved to die, I heard echoes of the crowds of people who said, Jesus, crucify him. Jesus did not just come to free the poor and oppressed. Jesus himself was poor and oppressed. This leads us into our second lesson from Jesus. To listen, learn, and partner with those among us who are most vulnerable. In the book of Luke, God promises God's kingdom to those in, in which no one has to live with lack, and all are free. To realize this just and loving vision in Luke, we must consider carefully what this actually requires of us in practice. This vision must start with and center those around us who endure the most hardships. Jesus came so that we all may have life, especially those of us who are denied full access to living now. May we have eyes to see the world as it is, dream of more just and loving worlds, listen to those made to live in poverty, those called criminals, and those our society has deemed worthy of punishment, and consider carefully what is required of us to collaborate with them so that we all may have life. May you lean into the invitations that may make you feel uncomfortable, and be open to be transformed and to respond to them in love. Amen.
Thank you, Cassie. I invite you to join us for our hymn, uh, in the New Century Hymnal, number 539, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant. Please rise. This is our time of prayer. Use this time of prayer to reflect and meditate on the joys and concerns of your own heart. If comfortable, you may close your eyes and listen to the pastoral prayer today as a meditation. Blessed God, the great mystery and wonder through which you work in our lives is beyond what we could ever imagine. In such awe, we thank you for the gift of the world we share and for the many bonds which unite us with all your people, whoever they are and wherever they might be. God bless us as we seek to find a way toward the peace you invite us to share with others. Guide us, God, on our walks of faith as we wrestle with new ideas about God. Have difficult conversations with others and take those uncomfortable first steps that demand action of us. Remind us that being faithful does not mean we close ourselves off from the ideas or faith of others. Help us to open our hearts and minds to people of every faith, culture, and way of life. May the mystery of your ways be the bridge that draws us together in community. We pray for those who are in special need of your grace and healing, for the victims of gun violence, for refugees seeking asylum, for the wrongfully accused and incarcerated, for the unhoused and marginalized, for the ill and dying. God, we ask for peace and justice. God, we trust you with us in our suffering. We trust in your spirit's power to bring comfort, faith, and strength where it is needed. We pray for your radical and scandalous love, which will move us and push us toward the kingdom here on earth you would have us be. For this we ask. In the name of the one we are called to follow, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Join me in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in, in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is our time of offering. If you have been spiritually nourished by today's worship service, I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider supporting the work and ministry of the church through a tithe or donation. Last week, we received a total of $355 to support the work and ministry of the church. Please visit our website to see the multiple ways you can give to the church during this time, such as through PayPal, Facebook, or by simply writing a check to the church. In addition to our normal offering today, we will also be taking a special offering for Cassie Chee's nonprofit organization, Faith Action for Community Equity. If you would like to donate to this organization today, we ask that you write your check directly to the nonprofit, Faith Action for Community Equity, or by writing it on the front of your envelope today. In, in our pursuit to follow our Lord, we are reminded of the visible ways Jesus gave to others. As he multiplied the fish and the bread so there might be enough for all to eat. As he extended healing to the sick and ate at tables with sinners and outsiders. As he willingly gave his own life for the liberation of his people. Let us now share a portion of our own good as we give with the same generous and righteous love as he did. Join me in a unison prayer of dedication for all we will receive. Giving God, we dedicate this money as evidence of our stewardship, as evidence of our assurance that you are the true source of prosperity. Our dollars and coins have no value in your eyes until they are invested according to your purposes. Use our time, our talents, and our treasure in loving service to build the welcoming and inclusive community you intend. Amen. Join us for our closing hymn, number 393 in the New Century Hymnal, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
After our worship service today, please stay for a few announcements. God's people, as you go out into the world, seek to follow Jesus. Follow his examples of compassion and kindness, the way he showed love and inclusion to others, his passion for justice and equity, and his hope for a world where there can be peace and life for everyone. This is his call to us all. Will you choose to follow him? Aloha.